This is The Comics Alternative, episode 198, reviews of The Black Dahlia, Kill or Be Killed, number one, and Sombra, number one. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And this week, Andy and I are going to be looking at three very interesting and also quite similar books. We're going to begin with The Black Dahlia. This is an adaptation of James Elroy's novel, adapted by Matt's David Fincher, with art by Miles Heyman. After that, we're going to look at issue number one of Kill or Be Killed, from the team of Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips, and Elizabeth Breitweiser. And then we're going to finalize things with Sombra Number 1, written by Justin Jordan, with art by Raul Trevino. But before we get to those titles, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every month, you'll find some incredible specials, including this month as we approach the end of July. Now, sometimes those specials will be for 45% off cover price. Sometimes you can find discounts at 50% off cover price, but often you can find specials that are more impressive than that. That's right, and this month is in every month they have a load of bundles that you can take advantage of where you get a deeper discount on multiple comics from the same publisher than you'd get if you bought those comics individually. This month there are a lot of bundles from, from DC uh, as part of their Rebirth launch, but also including um, Vertigo. And there are also uh, bundles with significant discounts from uh, Double Take and, as usual, Valiant, where if you buy all eight Valiant comics, you get 50% off. That's right. Every month is Bundle Month at Discount Comic Book Service, so go to their website and find out more about those specials. That's dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, this is the tail end of July. Uh, next week will be our first episode for August. And what that means for us, for the podcast, is that this will be our four-year anniversary next week. Wow. So if, uh, if we were a kid, uh, he would be four years old. Mm-hmm. And then we'd be about the age that we could start leaving him at home alone, I think. But right, I don't have kids, so I'm just guessing that, that that's the age when you can start leaving the kid home alone. Sure, leave him alone. Just make sure that the front door is locked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and all the sharp objects are put away. Yeah, and and if anything happens, at that age, they bounce back very quickly. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Okay. So that means there's still hope for us uh, yeah. uh, with, with only uh, only being four years old. And, you know, on the one hand, it seems like time has really flown by. Uh, on the other, though, I, at times I get a feeling that we've been doing this for longer than four years. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, it is it is one of the longer commitments I've ever had in my life. Mm. Well, <laughs> I'm glad to be a part of that. <laughs> OK, does Jennifer know that? Yeah. Okay, sure. good. <laughs> yeah, other than her. Okay, yeah. so so we're second to your marriage. <laughs> that that is true. <laughs> so anyway, it, it it being our fourth birthday, if any of our dear listeners want to get in touch with us, uh you can send us email, Facebook, Twitter. Uh get in touch with us any number of ways and wish us a happy birthday. And in fact, if you want to record a birthday greeting, uh, for us and then email it to us or better yet go to the website and use speakpipe to record it from your computing device uh, mobile or desktop 
it, it's easy enough to do. We'd appreciate that. And, yeah. you know, those recordings we can play back next week if we get any. Of course, now that I've said this, it dawns on me if no one does this, it's going to sound real sad if uh, we have nothing for next week. Yeah, maybe you should, uh, one of us should uh, do like uh, what what Donald Trump did and pretend, you know, call call in pretending <laughs> to be somebody else uh, that uh, that is wishing us a happy birthday. Yeah, we can do other voices. Okay, so, you know, there you go. So, something really happy and and positive. Our fourth birthday, our anniversary, and then you bring in Donald Trump. Yeah. So. I got to work on my other voices now. <laughs> Hello. Oh yeah, what's what's that, what's that actor's name? He used to be on Sanford and Son. Was it, I was I was doing someone like Frank Nelson or someone like that, uh. <laughs> or or uh, Ed Wynn. <laughs> I don't know. I think that that was Ed Wynn on Cold Medicine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, again, our four year anniversary, our birthday for next week's episode. So if you want to wish us a happy one, then do get in touch with us, record a message. We'd appreciate that. Yep. And, you know, Andy, before we get to our discussion of those three books, though, there's there are a couple of other things that we should mention, uh, and they're all award-related big news. Now, the biggest news is that a couple of days ago, the winners of this year's Eisner Awards were mentioned, and we have a few things to say about that. But I also want to mention uh, a very different kind of award from someone who's been on the podcast a couple of times. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Sunny Liu won mm -hmm. the Singapore. Literature Prize for English Fiction for his book from this year, The Art of Charlie Chen Hak Che. And, uh, and, and that was really big news. Yeah, that's great to hear that uh, because that is, that is a straight-up literature prize. And I think this is the first time it's gone to a graphic novel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's, that is important to point out that this is not an award for in Singapore for you know comic or graphic novel. Uh, it's for Literature Prize for English Fiction. So Sonny got it. He, he's been on the podcast twice this year. Once when the book first came out, Gwen and I interviewed him. And then when he came to UT Dallas to speak, I recorded mm. his presentation and we aired that uh, back in April. So yep. congratulations, Sonny, for that award. Yeah, congratulations. And in terms of the Eisner Awards that were given out on Friday evening at the San Diego Comic Con, congratulations to all those winners. Yep. Many of whom have been guests on the show. That's true. Uh, or so, so multiple guests, exactly. multiple times, some for yeah. some. Or if they weren't guests on the show, then th these are definitely creators whose works we've looked at at least once. Yeah. And many of the winners, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this list now. It seems like the majority we've either reviewed or uh, interviewed the creators over the past year. Yeah, yeah. So the um, the ones we we've interviewed include um, Peter Cooper, mm -hmm. who won for best graphic album for Ruins, and um, you had you interviewed Bill Griffith. That's right. He won for best writer slash artist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we've had on the show uh, Brian K. Vaughn, who clearly, you know, I, I would say we have some some bear some responsibility for him winning yeah. an award because otherwise that uh, you know uh he came he came out of nowhere to win that <laughs> and, uh, you know, but in fact i think many of the winners benefited by what we've called the comics alternative bump yep being but on the, the show gave him uh some gravitas <laughs> yeah and and i think i think we need to add an, another another kind of bump to it because we have um you know, to to the ones that I was ha I was happiest with, but just because these are are close friends of the show, mm -hmm. was um, was Craig Yo winning for best reprint uh, for album for um, the Walt Kelly book, Walt Kelly book, and uh, Tom Heinches winning for 
um, best uh, comics related periodical for for Hogan's Alley. Uh, now both of them not only are friends of the show, but we were on a panel with them at Heroes Con. That's right. So we were on the panel with them last month, and I also had the opportunity to talk with both of them together mm-hmm. uh, at Heroes Con, and I even talked about the two of them being nominated and wondered if a couple of months from this time, if you know, when I talk to you next, you will be. Eisner winners, and both of them were. Yeah, and I would I would add too under best since speaking of that panel under best academic scholarly work the anthology the Blacker the Ink Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art, which is edited by Francis Gateward and John Jennings, won. And Craig Fisher has an essay in there about Nat Turner. So technically, I would say that half of the panel that we were on won Eisner Awards. Yeah. <laughs> so we were the odd men out then. Yeah, and and the the sixth uh, member, the um the librarian also mm-hmm. wasn't nominated. But um yeah, and then and then I think the one other I, I skipped over is that uh, Bill Shelley won right. the Harvey Kurtzman book, which a lot of people were seeing as kind of a I saw like Several people mentioned that that was kind of a surprise, but well deserved. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, and the weird thing is, the day before. No, in fact, it wasn't the day before. It was the day of the awards. Uh, I was listening. I don't know if you've heard this episode yet. Uh, one of the more recent episodes of Gilbert Gottfried's amazing Colossal Podcast, mm-hmm. uh, where he talks to uh, Al Jaffe, and Jaffe yeah. briefly. Me- uh, and then, oh, who was the other mad creator? I can't remember. Um, Dick. Dick- Dick D. Bartolo. That's right. Uh, um, but there was one point in that conversation. Hey, did you hear that episode? Yes. 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 And so he talks uh, briefly, uh, Jaffe does, about her Kurtzman. So I got in touch with Bill Shelley and told him, I said, I don't know if you know about this podcast, but on a very recent episode, uh, Al Jaffe is one of the guests, and he talks about Kurtzman for a bit. Mm-hmm. And so he was going to go check that out. And that was just hours before the award. And mm. then Bill won it. He said yeah. he was surprised because I, I emailed him back uh, that next morning, Saturday, and said, uh, you know, congratulations. And he said he he was completely surprised. He had mm-hmm. no idea that he would be a contender. I mean, he knew he was nominated, but – right. Uh, so, you know, uh, another person who we've had on the show before, uh, while at SPX, uh, Durf Backdurf won for Best Lettering in Trashed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was one of the the wins that I thought was most interesting because I, I think that's well-deserved too. But uh, I wonder how many, uh, how many people voted for that because Trashed didn't get nominated in other categories that it, that it probably should have. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. No. Um. I think um, I'm. I don't know. I, I'm not surprised. I'm not not surprised about the winners. I mean, there's certain things worth observing, um, but uh, the titles here are many of the ones that I ended up voting for. And if something won that I didn't vote for, you know, it's like, well, it makes sense that they won as well. Yeah, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any real complaints about this uh, this batch of winners. Yeah, I mean, there may be one or two that I'm wondering. Well, nah, I, I don't see it. But, um, but again, overall, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's uh, it, it's a really interesting list. Uh, a lot of top titles. Again, uh, most of which we've discussed on the show at some point. For instance, best short story, Winning and Dying, Tomini. Uh Best continuing series, Southern Bastards. Best limited series, The Fade Out. Uh, Mm -hmm. which we talked about. We've also reviewed uh, Paper Girl. That was the best new series. Little Robot, Andy and Quinn reviewed that on the Young Reader show. Um, And although we didn't review it, I know that Wolverton and I discussed Super Mutant Magic Academy uh, during our SPX show. Mm Mm-hmm. So and I could go down the list. Uh, you know, March Book Two, Ruins, um, Two Brothers. Even though we didn't discuss it on the show, it was one of my favorites of last year. And then one of your top ones, the Drawn in Quarterly Twenty Five Year mm-hmm. uh, Volume, that got Best Anthology. So, mm-hmm. and then yes. Eternot, one of my favorites from last year, Best Archival Collection or Project Strips. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, one thing that stands out to me about this list is, you know how. When the nominees were uh, announced earlier this year, there was quite a bit of press on the number of female creators 
who were yes. nominated. And I'm looking through this list that the winners now do not really bear that out. Hmm. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. But that I, I, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, you have Julian Tamaki for Super Mutant Magic Academy, Kate Beaton, Step Aside Pops, uh, and then you have Noel Stevenson for Nimona. Uh, and, and there are maybe a couple of others, but not near, I guess, uh, the proportion of those that were nominated. Mm. Um, but those who won, I mean, all of these titles and creators seem to make sense to me. There's nothing that really stands out as, as weird or unusual. Good. So we weren't there at the awards. Um, maybe, maybe someday we'll get to go to uh, San Diego, either individually or together. Yeah. And uh, experience the awards ceremony firsthand. But, uh, you know, we, we did that episode... Uh, with Carol Tilly on the nominees. So that, that mm-hmm. was a lot of fun. And I think that's where the fun discussion is because once you know the winners have been announced, I mean, it's worth mentioning, but I don't mm-hmm. think there's near as much uh, discussion topic there. Yeah. And I think, I think our influence is stronger on the nominees than it is on the nominations than it is on the winners. Yeah. <laughs> what influence? Well, Andy, you want to get into the discussion of this week's books? Yes, let's do it. Okay, the first one we're going to look at is the adaptation of James L. Roy's The Black Dahlia. This has been adapted by David Fincher and Matz, and with art by Miles Hyman, came out last month from Archaea. And we were talking right before we started to record. I'd ask you if you had read Elroy's novel, The Black Dahlia, that this is based mm-hmm. on, and you said yes. Yeah, I, I've I've read the the L.A. Quartet. I was in fact pretty hard in Elroy for a while. Um, I I think that I quit reading him. I hit a I kind of hit a wall with him with his his novel Bloods Are Over, which was a part of the um, next series that he had done that started with American tabloid. Uh, and, um, and the wall I had hit was in his, his style because uh, that, that book was almost entirely written in fra- sentence fragments and became really, really hard to read for me to just keep reading. Um, but when I was reading the adaptation of the black Dahlia here, I just, I realized I have, I have very little memory of the book, though I again I know I've read it, and I think part of it is that when I was reading Elroy's stuff, and I have this experience with a lot of noir writers. Uh, I was noticing this when we were talking to Rich Tommaso not that long ago, that I tend to I tend to kind of devour these books pretty quickly. Um, I think uh, with with Elroy, I tend to read his novels in one or two days. I know with the white jazz, which was the fourth book of the LA quartet. I read that in an afternoon and I proceed and then subsequently don't have much memory of them. I don't know why that is. Uh, so as I was reading this, I was trying to trying to remember how accurate this might be or how faithful an adaptation this might be. And, uh, I really wasn't able to evaluate that. Hmm. Um, uh, it, you know, it's worth mentioning for those who may not be be aware that Elroy's novel used as kind of a, a starting point the actual historical murder of Elizabeth Short uh, in 1947, uh, and so that work of fiction was based on a historical, an actual historical account. And now we mm. have here the Matt's. Fincher and Hyman adaptation of the Black Dahlia novel into graphic novel form that was then based, mm-hmm. at least, you know, in, in some ways on an actual historical event. So it's kind of interesting how one level of of, of narrative uh, bedrock, I guess, kind of leads to another. Yeah, and that's that's a, a fairly common strategy for Elroy in 
uh, well, in a lot of his fiction, but in the in the L.A. Quartet, he you know, taken together those those four books give a kind of picture of what, especially um, you know, the police department and politics in Los Angeles were in the uh, late forties and uh, through the nineteen fifties. Yeah, so, you even have a reference to the Zoot Suit Riots. Yeah, you have a reference to Zoot Suit Riots, and then there's. Um, uh, like L.A. Confidential references some significant events in the you know in the L.A. Uh, legal system at the time and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of you know inter- intersection with historical events and figures that um, that Elroy is drawing connections through. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, I, you know, one way of looking at this, or I guess any kind of adaptation, is to compare it to the original. And I know that a lot of people read that way. I, I don't do so uh, mm-hmm. for, for the for the most part, and then kind of judge the quality according to the original. Mm-hmm. So, does it stack up, or what? Yeah, how faithful, in other words, is it to the original mm-hmm. source? Whether it be you know a comic based on a novel or a film or some other form of media, uh, I, I don't know if that's the most productive way of going about mm-hmm. uh, looking at a, at a work of adaptation. Uh, although, if there were problems in the narrative, in other words, there were holes that in reading it, and that's the only version you're familiar with. And those holes were caused by some problems of adaptation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean th- that I think is is fair for discussion. Me not having read the original Elroy novel, coming to the Black Dahlia, I'd heard of it, I, but I didn't know the story. I didn't know the novel. Now I've read the graphic novel version. I felt that I had a pretty good sense of what was going on, in that there were no glaring holes that made me uh, of my comprehension that made me wonder. I wonder how much is left out from the original novel. Right, right, and um, I, I think, I think if anything, what what you don't get is some uh, aspects of his uh, of Elroy's style, his descriptions, and so on. Um, that that's the main thing, but you do get his dialogue and and things like that. Yeah, uh, it's so I, I really enjoyed this book. Um, so you know we have again the original story by James Elroy, but one of the things that that well another thing that caught my attention was the fact that one of the adapters was Matt's, and I really like his work. Uh, he did the the Killer series, uh, which is mm-hmm. also actually in the U.S. published by Archaea. Hmm. Yeah, and you know when you mentioned Matt's, I was also wondering about what what David Fincher's contributions were here, um, because um, David Fincher being you know a major film filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, but as far as I can tell, didn't have anything to do with the the film version of the Black Dahlia that came out about ten years ago. Uh, Brian De Palma directed it, and Josh Friedman wrote the screenplay for that. So I don't know if the, if this is uh, you know Fincher actually uh, adapting Elroy's book for um, the comic book medium, or if maybe Fincher had done a draft of uh, you know a screenplay adaptation that this um, that this is taking advantage of. You know that is interesting. I hadn't considered that that maybe he had worked on uh, a screen adaptation, didn't do anything with it, or couldn't do anything with it, and then went on to work with Matts to to kind of massage it into a, a graphic novel adaptation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, regardless of how this came about, I, I think it reads really, really well. Uh, and it, uh, it it's one of those books that you have to, or at least I did. I, I kept turning back to make sure that I didn't miss anything, because the road that our main character Bucky uh, Blankert, uh mm. goes down. I mean, ends up being, at, you know, as you would expect in a in a noir crime narrative like this, full of twists and mm. twists within twists. So you think you have the primary trajectory of what's going on, but then there's a complication. And then once you, once I was getting into that facet of uh, the story, I had to go back and remind myself mm-hmm. what other branch I had had been on before this other. Uh, and I and I enjoyed that. It, it, so in other words, this is not one of those books that 
I, I could go through very quickly. Um, I had to keep going back to remind myself, but in a good way. I mean, there, there are occasions when I read books and I have to keep looking back because I think I missed something or something didn't capture my attention, mm-hmm. and that bugs me. I kept going back to, to look at previous events in this book, but in a way that I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I think part of it re- requires that because um, even from the very beginning, and uh, Bucky is the narrator uh, of the book, um, even from the beginning he points out that um, that er, kind of everything he knew was a lie. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he says that 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 explicitly, but uh, so that once uh, the mystery starts to fall into place, uh, and we realize, and and we realize along with Bucky what's really been going on the whole time. Um, you know, we we do have to kind of reevaluate. The narrative and put the pieces back together is just as I think any good mystery does. Right, and you know what what uh, what they do here is of course what what many noir narratives have, and that is you know the the narrating presence. All of this that we're about to read has happened in the past, and so where the narrator is uh, is basically as you describe. You know this is what happened to me, and boy, I didn't expect that, or it you know it it turned out to to leave me where I am today. Uh, so we know that everything that we're about to experience has already taken place in the narrator's past. Mm-hmm. So we know that the narrator doesn't get whacked, uh, you know, unless it's some kind of Sunset Boulevard thing. Uh, but um, so we we know that there are quite a number of complications. We just don't know exactly what those are. But uh, so so Bucky's the narrator, and he mm-hmm. is paired or partnered on the L.A. Uh, police force and the, the warrants unit. Uh, with Lee Blanchard, mm-hmm. and both of these guys are boxers. Yeah, yeah, and so their their well, connection. Boxers. Yeah, their connection even before they were um, police officers was uh, that they they were at least aware of each other as as boxers, and um, they come together as, as cops at, uh, for a, a, a kind of special showcase boxing match between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, that's, that's where they connect. And they also, they also ultimately connect over the third main character in the book, uh, Kay Lake, Mm -hmm. who we see at the, at the beginning is Lee Blanchard's girlfriend, but they don't really have what, what seems to be a romantic relationship going on. And so when, uh, when Bucky comes in, the three of them in, in a sense, form a unit, of of their own and and Bucky even states over and over again that this is you know the happiest he's ever been in his life is with these other two people. Now, can you remember in the original if there's even a hint that there's anything kinky going on among Bucky, Lee, and Kay, or is it just a, a platonic three way friendship? You know, I, you know, I don't really, uh, honestly, don't really remember. But you know, I think there's, there isn't, there, there is. I don't know about kinky. If there's a, <laughs> there, there are like three, three ways going on. But, but I, I do think we're we're meant to get a sense that, um, that there is a kind of homoerotic potential between Lee and Bucky that ends up getting kind of filtered through K mm-hmm. but also manifests itself not so much as you know not so much sexually but through the boxing right um, so that that subtext is is definitely there mm-hmm. I was wondering though if you could remember it being more there in the novel than in the graphic yeah, novel. yeah no, I don't remember uh, so you know that's that's intriguing. So the, the relationship among the three of those people. Um, but I think even more interesting is the kind of strange, complicated identity relationships that are going on here. Uh, so the the death in this book, actually, the, what the title refers to, is the actual historical murder of Elizabeth Short. And so Elizabeth mm-hmm. Short is how old is she? Seventeen when she's murdered. 
Uh, I she's think really, so. Yeah, yeah, she's really young. And she's not just murdered, but she's mutilated. Uh, her, her mouth is – it reminds me of uh, uh, the Joker, right? You know, mm-hmm. the mouth is cut to where it looks like the grin goes literally ear to ear. Um, but she's also disemboweled and cut in half. Right. Uh, short is. And investigations into this brutal murder lead the police – uh, to to discover that this is someone who um, was rather loose, who had a thing for servicemen, uh, for soldiers mm-hmm. and sailors, mm-hmm. and that she would um, – well, she had a, uh, let's say, colorful uh, history uh, in her young life, and that probably contributed to her murder. But they don't know what happened. And so mm-hmm. when Bucky is investigating it, he eventually ends up turning – Turning up uh, at, at first a suspect, but then she doesn't seem to be after a while, uh, Madeline Sprague. Mm-hmm. And Madeline has an uncanny resemblance to Elizabeth Short. And that's when things get really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, Bucky ends up the, starting a relationship with her that seems to be purely physical. Uh, and in fact, gets into kind of fetishy territory when he actually when they when she actually performs as Elizabeth Short for him but it, what what I find interesting there is that both Bucky and Lee become obsessed with the Black Dahlia murder case but their obsession manifests itself in different ways mm-hmm. um Bucky Bucky's is you know almost purely sexual Whereas um, Lee's is much more complicated, and I think that's where, again, the, some of the big um, plot twists and so on uh, take place within that. Exactly. And you could, there's a lot about this book that obviously we can't give away mm-hmm. uh, because that's, that's you know, the power of the narr- this particular narrative here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, yeah, Lee's relationship, you're right, is very different uh, than Bucky's uh, to the Elizabeth Short case because with Lee, it's more of a, of a, a big brother thing that's going on here, uh, or mm-hmm. at least it seems that way. Um, but then you end up finding out more about Lee just as Bucky does. Um, mm-hmm. Bucky doesn't really know – his partner like he thought he did and i think that's i mean that that's one of the things that drives bucky to continue into the investigation along with this this fetishy thing with madeline mm. that he sees and he refers to her as elizabeth short so it's as uh, you know he's fucking his own case here yeah yeah and uh, and there is some just to, to let listeners know too. There's some very graphic sex scenes in this in this book as well. Yeah, and then down in Tijuana, things get really weird. With, <laughs> uh, is it the Satan Club or Club Satan? Yeah, it's one of those two. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that gets interesting. And this, this entire book, I think, is just is just fascinating, and it's one of those that had me going at it almost nonstop. Yeah, yeah, I read it all. I read it all in one sitting, which uh, also kind of makes me want to go back and reread um, the novel. Since, as, as, like, as far as my memory is concerned, I pretty much would be coming to him fresh. It seems <laughs> like, uh, though, I do. I do feel like I have a pretty good memory of of L.A. Confidential for some reason. Uh, I don't know why that one stood out to me. Maybe because uh, of the more, movie. Uh, no, because the movie takes some serious departures from the novel, mm. uh, but that that also makes. I, I'm also wondering if um, you know this adaptation is going to be part of a series. I hope so, because the um, Black Dahlia was the first of the LA Quartet, right? Right, right. And and as far as I remember, the the one character that moves through the other books that we see in this first book is is the district attorney ellis Lowe. Mm-hmm. um other than other than him i don't think there's a lot of characters in this book that um reappear at least not significantly in the other in the other books again i may be wrong about that but um that's that's what my memory is and um and you know i think one of the one of the things with 
uh, the movie version of L.A. Confidential. I do like that movie a lot, but it it definitely tightens up what's a much, much more sprawling uh, narrative. And um, so I don't imagine I, I imagine they, they couldn't you know, they couldn't have made a movie based on that book that that followed that plot accurately but i think it did a good job of condensing it so i'd be curious to see if we see um the big nowhere which hasn't been made into a movie um la confidential and white jazz uh, coming out possibly even from the same team that'd be great because uh, i think that the the team really hit it out of the park um mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I don't know outside of film in anything that David Fincher or what he would bring to this. So maybe you're right that is that this is something like a, an initial screenplay that he was working on. I mean, this is perfect for Matts and the kind of stories, mm-hmm. crime stories that he tells. Yeah. So it definitely has that feel to this. Uh, so oh. uh, he, I think he fit right in with this. Well, what do you think about the art of Miles Hyman? Yeah, I think I think Miles Hyman has a really interesting art style. I think first of all that he captures the the 1950s um or in the late 1940s um LA milieu really really well. Um his settings are great, uh but also the the style has that that kind of feel of the you know the buildings and the um, you know the ar- the the architecture, the cars. Uh, he draws all that stuff really well. Uh, the the clothing that people are wearing. Um, his his uh, the only one one of the things I would comment on though is that is his faces often come across as somewhat expressionless to me. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I think that um, that isn't necessarily as um, a huge drawback to the book, but uh, the um, you know getting getting someone first of all who can draw you know cars and um, and buildings and stuff so well and so accurately, but also capture what is largely the feel of the place. Uh, I think is a, an accomplishment. Exactly. Um, I don't know if you felt this, it, and it's it's different. I, I'm not saying that it looks a lot like his, but uh, Hyman's art reminded me of Rick Geary. But I'm wondering if I'm thinking about Rick Geary in terms of his murder stories, right? And so this being in many ways all about murder, uh, and I look at the style and I think Rick Geary. I mean it's different, but mm-hmm. uh, I couldn't help but think of that as I was reading this. No, I think that's definitely there again in the in the background and in some of the shading choices that he makes. Mm-hmm. I, I do I do see that. Okay, um, this this is something else I'm curious about, and I I don't know what the answer is because I don't think it's clear on the copyright page. But it says if you if you look on the copyright page, this edition reprints. Le Dalia Noir, originally published in French by Casterman, uh, Pelo, and uh, R- Rivagas, uh, or Rivag. And mm. so, cause, so obviously the Black Dahlia was first published in English. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm wondering is, is this adaptation based on the French translation or was – this graphic novel originally published in French, and I'm thinking of you know maths here, um, but then translated into English. Oh, well, that that could be. Uh, I didn't pay attention to that, so uh, I wasn't uh, thinking about that. I know the um, the back cover doesn't give any uh, information along those lines, but yeah, it does say it is. Um, the edition reprints, uh, yeah, Le yeah, Noir. which was from 1988. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, huh. Huh. I'll, uh, I'll have to maybe look something up about that. Yeah. See, I would guess since the French translation of the Black Dahlia was published in 88, 
and they're using that one, then it is the French version that they're adapting, which again, I guess, would make sense because if Matt's uh, is mm-hmm. one of the adapters, um, who knows? But uh, regardless of what version these guys were working from, I, I I think they did a top job on the Black Dahlia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, it says on the uh, on the French French Wikipedia page, um, it says it was published in 2013. What the graphic novel? Yeah. Okay. It, but my my French is not great, so <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. Huh. Uh, well, that being the case, then I wonder who. Let me see who the translator was. It says in there. Okay. It says in, uh, who the translator is in the the page. I'm not. I I'm looking at. I have a PDF and I don't have that open right now. So. Uh, I, I'm just wondering if, if that is the case. If there, if the the question that we asked, um, is there a um, is there a sequel? Hmm. Um, see if the French had published it. Yeah. Now, the, yeah, I see. Yeah, the uh, the uh, original eighty eight translation of the novel was translated by uh, Freddie Mikalski. Um, mm-hmm. oh, so, I see. That's what it's saying. Yeah. Hmm. Because I'm, in looking at the uh, Amazon France page, uh, it doesn't look like there's another one, but it does look like there are. Um, this is part of a series of American noir um, novels being a- adapted into Band Dessinée, uh, including. Um, and you're looking on the French Amazon uh, site. Amazon site, yeah, including uh, Dennis Lehane's Shutter Island. Um, uh, let's see. I'm not sure what some of these others are. Um, but and it looks like Matt's is one of the contributors to this series. Well, you know, I'm wondering, uh, again, another supposition here, if mm-hmm. that Archaea boom – is mm-hmm. going to be publishing in English this series of French crime comics or adaptations uh, in, in comic form. And, and I, one of the reasons why I say this is that on the cover of the book, you have the Black Dahlia and then underneath the title, a crime graphic novel. And the mm-hmm. way that that's worded just strikes me as something kind of series-like that Archaea might be doing because otherwise – I don't know. The, the wording seems to be a little unusual if that's not the case. Now, it doesn't say it's part of a series, but it just sounds like this could be mm-hmm. a part of uh, a project that Archaea may have uh, going on now, and that is to pub- put out these adaptations of crime fiction. Yeah, maybe. And um, I'm not sure. And it looks like they've that, that Matts and Miles Hyman have also um, – I've also collaborated on the uh, adaptation of a Jim Thompson novel. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, here, here, you know, the two guys doing research on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pardon us. We'll, you know, go <laughs> occupy yourselves, listeners, while we do what we should have done <laughs> before, before we got started. Or, yeah. yeah. I had forgotten that um, about the translation uh, avenue for this book, but uh, it was it was only the last minute that I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. This uh, this does have some translation issues we can bring up as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Gee, I, I'd be curious to see if there are any future titles that are like this, uh, either by Elroy or other uh, mm-hmm. crime writers. So I really enjoyed this. Yeah, yeah. So um, the um, uh, the Jim Thompson novel that the two of them adapt is called. Um, Savage, Savage Night, I think. Yeah, Savage Night. It, and uh, I was trying to figure out what the book was because the the French title does not translate directly mm-hmm. to Savage Night for for me anyway. So anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great if they if they did. Um, you know, we 
you you spend some time with uh, band SNA anyway, uh, but that you know that there are American noir novels that are being translated and adapted in French and then translated back into English uh, is is interesting phenomenon. Yeah, and I, you know I'll have to ask Edward about that because mm-hmm. Edward was the translator along with Matt's of the Killer uh series mm-hmm. that Arkea did. So maybe he has some kind of uh, inside scoop on on what we've been speculating about for the past yes. <laughs> what 15 <laughs> minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Andy, let's go ahead and move on to the other two titles that we're going to be discussing. Uh, And both of them also deal with crime. Right. Um, Now, this is a title that will officially be coming out the week after you hear this. Okay, So the first Mm -hmm. week in August, you will see this book, but we have a, a preview copy. And so we're now going to be talking about Kill or Be Killed, number one. Written by Ed Brubaker, with art by Sean Phillips, and colors by Elizabeth Breitweiser. Uh, And this is the team that brought us other great things when it comes to to crime fiction and comics in noir. uh, The most recent being The Fade Out, the now Eisner Award winning The Fade Out. Yes, that's right. So um, it's – yeah, it's timely that we're going to be talking about this. Right. Right. so this is this is a, a different kind of crime series from Brubaker and Phillips. Um, it, it's it's quite a bit different from the last one, the Fade Out, which is more you know historically anchored. This seems to me more similar because of a certain twist to what they were doing with Fatal. Possibly, possibly, well, yeah, and um, and I, I mean, I think that that we can probably talk a little bit about that twist uh, because it's such a central part of the book, and I think because I think one of the mysteries of this book is um, is there something supernatural going on? Right, and, and by the way, we should mention this is an image release, as yeah. you know, a lot of things that Brew Baker and Phillips have been doing lately. Yeah, yeah, and so um, the the main character Dylan. Uh, we we first see at the beginning of the book going on uh, a pretty bloody crime, uh, murder spree mm-hmm. uh, with a shotgun killing um, killing only bad guys, uh, which is part of what he uh, you know his uh, mo, uh, but also through his his narration giving us a, a kind of um, I don't know a diatribe on the state of the world um you know complaining for example that um that the government is run by big business uh that terrorism is uh running amok and uh psychopaths run for president he said so So it um, is rather timely yeah, it's absolutely rather timely. <laughs> and in fact, in the ba- in the back matter, Brubaker kind of talks about that he had a different project in mind as the follow as what was going to follow the fade out. But this one, this one kind of percolated to the surface, uh, especially in the um, you know contemporary political scene. Uh, so so anyway, um, so we 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 start with this really really violent scene, but then Dylan. Uh, flashes us back to um, what he thinks of as the the kind of narrative beginning, at least for this uh, for his uh, his situation uh, in which uh, he has gotten to the place where he want where he is um, killing bad guys. Right. And uh, and Dylan, when when we see him in the flashback, is is a pretty depressed. 28 year old grad student um you know i think we can we can understand <laughs> we can empathize. <laughs> empathize with that and um but he and, seems to be really depressed uh, yeah i mean his his life just doesn't seem to be going well and in fact i mean this is someone who in the past has attempted 
to 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 kill himself uh and then he recounts uh another instance when he attempts to, to kill himself. And this is when he's giving us information, as you were alluding to a second ago, trying to find, trying to pin the moment that a lot of this stuff began with him that leads him to the opening scene of him being this kind of, uh, you know, vengeance mm-hmm. in many ways seeking killer. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, he, at one point, he attempts to kill himself, but by jumping off a building. And when he's relating that information, he, t- he tells us about a previous uh, occasion when he was younger where he tried to kill himself by taking pills. But in the more mm-hmm. recent attempt to kill himself, uh, something happens to where he ends up not dying. And he mm-hmm. thinks that that is linked to what happens to him next. And this is where the the series Killer Be Killed uh, becomes possibly something more supernatural. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think at least in this first issue, Brew Baker leaves that ambiguous. You can go, you know, you can go either way. Is right. is um. Is uh, is Dylan being manipulated by supernatural forces, or is has he somehow like psychologically snapped and uh, and is is uh, is hearing voices that are compelling him to do the things that he's doing? Exactly, because the information we get from Dylan as he's recounting his story, I mean, does give us reason to doubt. His sanity at times. I mean, given yes. that everything he's going through, and uh, you know, one of the things he's going through is with his friend, who's also the girlfriend of his roommate. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so Dylan has a, a female friend named Kira who comes to see him. Eventually, he tells us in in exposition um, that Kira ends up becoming involved with. Dylan's roommate Mason, who's younger than Dylan, and as if Dylan didn't feel like a loser to begin with, now he really feels that way. But then, in an interesting twist, Kira seems to come on to Dylan while she dating his roommate. So, you know, it's not as if our protagonist Dylan has any kind of stable emotional life going on right now. So, if 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 he is going a little wacky, then that would make sense. Right. But the demon that he thinks he sees, uh, the way that he's drawn by Phillips, uh, is pretty damn spooky. Yeah. Um, and so um, I, don't, I don't get a sense of how long Brubaker and, and Phillips' plan for Kill or Be Killed to be. Uh, it definitely does seem to be a finite story in some, uh, some degree. Um. And uh, but in the back matter, um, as uh, you know, and and with Brubaker, I always love getting the single issues because of the back matter. Right. Um, he he talks about this being his his foray into the vig- vigilante killer genre, um, and includes uh, back there is off again often with these uh, with Brubaker and Phillips's books an essay. This one by Devin Faraci on Death Wish, which is the king of all vigilante killer movies. So I, I'm guessing we're going to get a series of essays in the individual issues of Killer Be Killed about various vigilante killer movies. Oh, exactly. Yeah, another reason to, to really love Ed Brubaker comics is that he does give you that extra material, and you're right. It's a reason to get the individual issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, I like the collected editions, but again, if you just get that, then you're going to be missing out on a lot. And, you know, I, I really appreciate it when creators do that. Uh, Matt mm-hmm. Kent is another one that you can always count on to give you something in the individual comic book issues that you don't get in the collections. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, let me ask you. This is, I guess, roughly about I would call an average length of an image number one. And, and I'm bringing this up because with image, often creators will give us a substantial, a substantially longer than usual first mm-hmm. issue. Not all image creators, but some do. And uh, this strikes me as being around average length. And 
I get a sense that this is a good first issue. In other words, it sets up a lot, but I come away having finished this first issue feeling that I've gotten enough. Yeah, well, the the story, the first issue story proper runs almost thirty six pages. So maybe it's a tad longer, but it's not as long as as some image mm-hmm. number ones. I think you know the, the extreme example would be monstrous. I mean, that first right. issue was novelistic in nature, right? Uh, uh, and then we get a we get a significant again a significant amount of back matter right. as well. So uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a substantial issue for. Um, for readers anyway, but yeah, I mean, um, I think one of the things I like, and I don't know if, if this is something that they're going to do, if Brubaker and Phillips are going to do regularly, or if this is going to be just something for, for issue number one. Uh, and I guess the story proper I'm looking at is about 33 pages. Um, but, um, I know other creators have complained about the constraints of the 22 page comic. Uh, mm-hmm. That you know you have to have certain beats at certain points. You have to, you know, you have to have the ch- chapter end at exactly twenty-two pages. So I know, for example, that um, um, some of um, Jonathan Hickman's upcoming image books are not going to have set page lengths for the individual issues, and and that that has been the case with uh, the Dying and the Dead. Oh, that, exactly. Yeah. That book has has kind of hit a, pub- a publishing wall and. Uh, we'll be coming back on a more regular basis later. Uh, so uh, I, I think it would be interesting if um, if uh, Brubaker and Phillips maybe let the story breathe in that way as well, and maybe maybe the first thirty three page chapter isn't going to be the only one. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and like you had mentioned, I wonder. I mean, this does seem like one of those stories that we have, um, and, and, or at least the creators have an endpoint in mind. So this is going to be limited to a point. But I, I'm just curious how long it's going to be. I know that with the fade out, uh, at first it seemed as if it was going to be an ongoing. And, and, and that's the mm-hmm. kind of thing that Image will do many times is they will announce a new series, and more times than not, they won't listed as let's say one of six or one of any certain number in other words there, mm-hmm. there's no indication that this is going to be a mini series or any kind of limited series uh, and then you know, the creators just see what happens and if it sells really well then it could be an ongoing for quite a while if it doesn't then it's limited and i think that the latter may have happened to the fade out because it was and i can't remember how many issues we were into the fade out before we started to see a particular number of issues that we were going to get Right, right, and then it and then it ended at what issue twelve, right? Uh, was it twelve? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and and I know that the the deluxe edition is going to be coming out uh, in not too far from now. Mm-hmm. So so that should be should should be good. Now this strikes me as the kind of story that would fit into maybe a ten or twelve issue um, cycle. So because I, I don't know how. How much longer than that uh, Brew Baker could go? Let's say as opposed to to criminal, because you can always come up with new criminal stories. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm curious to see in issue number two uh, if we have a little more answer about Dylan's state of mind. Yeah, yeah, because I think where the first issue, you know, I, I think it was a smart narrative choice for Brew Baker to make to start the first issue with this violent action scene and then flash back so that we we get a sense that you know exciting things are going to come uh because otherwise uh, in the story proper there isn't a whole lot of action going on until the very end so i'll be curious to uh in the in the end kind of seems to be st- getting us to a place to set up where Dylan is when we meet him at the beginning of the story. Mm. Yeah. And, and it is good that we get as the narrator, someone whose state of mind we're questioning almost, you know, from or close to the very beginning. Once he gets mm-hmm. into a story, I think a lot of questions arise. So we wonder, you know, how accurate is he? And I couldn't help but thinking of Brett Easton, Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho, right? That mm-hmm. within the mind of the narrator, things seemed... Okay, yeah, I guess it does kind of make sense. But when you step outside of that that <laughs> mental frame, then wow, it gets it gets weird. Uh, 
Yeah, and actually, you know, if we think of, I don't know if we're going to segue into the next book, but if you think about classic uh, unreliable narrators, uh, one for me that often comes to mind is, of course, Marlowe and Heart of Darkness. Uh, exactly. Which is, uh, I don't. so I don't know if you're done with. No, uh, I think this is a good segue. <laughs> so, uh, Because Sombra, the new... Uh, again, Boom Studios book by Justin Jordan and Raul Trevino uh, is kind of set in the world of South American drug cartels, but definitely leans very heavily on Heart of Darkness. Exactly. Uh, and in fact, you have um, what, what seems to be the protagonist is this DEA, a young DEA agent named Danielle Marlowe. Right. And she, yeah, and so she is on a case to find out information about her fa- the mystery surrounding her father, father whose name interestingly enough is Conrad Marlowe. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh so anybody reading this and feeling like extra smart that they they figured out <laughs> that it's a heart of darkness uh uh, homage or whatever you want to call it, uh, Jordan telegraphs it pretty well. Yeah, um, and that and that's okay. I mean, you know, we've seen we've seen Heart of Darkness used in a lot of different ways. Right. Uh, you know, probably most notably that you know uh, in Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now mm-hmm. is a examination of the Vietnam War. So I think within the world of of drug cartels, especially the uh, and and the milieu that um, that Jordan and Trevino set up at the beginning, uh, this is this is a world in which uh, you know laws and governments don't really factor all that much. And so, uh, if there's any place where someone can uh, fall into a kind of moral black hole and 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 become an un uh, an uncontrolled monster in the in the way we we get uh, that the protagonist's father has become uh, that that makes sense to to set it in this in this world. Yeah, and you know I like the way that you put it, uh, moral black hole. I, I get the sense that with all three of these titles, uh, I, I, you know, because I was reading them one following the next. Right, right. By the time, and, and I can tell you, Sombra, the first issue of Sombra was the third. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, I wanted to make sure that I read Black Dahlia first, and then I read Killer Be Killed. And then now Sombra number one, it's like, oh my God, you know, just, I, I just feel like I'm down that moral black hole now <laughs> uh, because the world just seems really bleak now. But um, you're right. Yeah, th- there is uh, there is that. Um, now, one thing that makes this first issue of Sombra uh, even, even more mysterious is that Danielle ends up hearing about and then searching and eventually meeting – a figure by the name of Tolva, who, if I if I'm reading correctly, uh, Tolva is a guy who is a journalist or who had some kind of link to journalism, mm-hmm. uh, and then he started investigating this mystery that that Danielle is, you know, in, in many ways trying to, to ferret out, and then he it seems to affect him in such a way that he gets sucked into this, as you mm-hmm. put it, black hole, to where it affects him, kind of like. You know, a, a Marlowe or uh, like a, a Kurtz character. Mm-hmm. Well, there is He's in Heart the, of you know, Go ahead. There is in Heart of Darkness the other character whose name I can't remember, who is sent, who is who is. Oh, that's um, right. Yes, Marlowe's predecessor, who's sent down to get to get Kurtz and uh, and goes native in a sense, mm-hmm. and in. Um, and I can't remember what his occupation is in the book, but in Apocalypse Now, it's the character that Dennis Hopper plays, who is a who is a photojournalist. Right. Uh, and so I was when I was reading this, I I kind of immediately clicked. Oh, this this might be, um, this might be the equivalent of the Dennis Hopper character. Yeah. So he's not quite as unhinged. It seems you know he he, he speaks pretty 
coherently co- compared to what uh, Dennis Hopper does in the movie. Yeah, uh, although we don't see Tolva for that long. He he appears no. in the final pages, so we don't have much of an opportunity to see that he's potentially crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would be interesting to see how this pans out. Now, on the topic of this panning out, we should mention that this is the first of four issues. And so, you know, one of the things that Boom does that uh, Image often does not, as we mentioned a little while ago in talking about the new Brubaker Phillips title, is that they will tell you if something is a miniseries almost at the you know at the get go. So here we have this is going to be a four issue series, and given the setup in this first issue, along with the ambition of you know the links to heart of darkness it, it it's going to be i think a uh, um a challenge let's say to include all of this in four issues and have it seemed um thorough cogent and compl- you know as mapped out as as possible uh and, and i don't doubt that that jordan can do this uh it just seems like if he's wanting to take on in a variety of different ways the heart of darkness, then mm-hmm. you would need more than four issues, but maybe not. Yeah. Well, I, you know, heart, heart of darkness is, uh, is a novella, right. As it stands. So, um, you know, we're, we're getting, you know, uh, un- unlike, unlike heart of darkness though. And, and uh, really, I think unlike the other two books we, we talked about, which I think is, is interesting that, um, Jordan makes the choice not to have uh, the main character, whose name I keep forgetting. Um, what's her name? Danielle. Danielle. Yeah, that Danielle actually narrate right. the story. Uh, we we are kind of in her. We're in her narrative perspective in that we are learning about what's happening. Right. She's our uh, proxy. Yeah. Exactly. But there are there isn't. There aren't narrative caption boxes or anything like that, like there were in the previous two books we just talked about. Which I found, you know, again, when you talk about reading these things in proximity, I may not have noticed that if I hadn't been reading these together and noticed that in the sense too that you know we're not um, there. There, you know, that that seems to be a choice Jordan made. In a way, kind of that work that works against the heart of darkness source, right? And you know, it's it's for this reason that of the three, now all three are crime stories, but uh-huh. of the three, somber number one seems the least noir, bec- and, and I think primarily mm. because you don't have that same kind of narration strategy as you did with the Black Dahlia and Killer Be Killed, because those, I mean, that, you know, that's a, tr- a classic move if, with noir narrative, uh, and we don't have that in somber. You know, it's definitely crime; it just gives it a different feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's uh, we're also in, you know. Compared with the others, we're in an even darker place. It seems like morally than than those others go. You know, uh, so yeah. And you know, I, I it just dawned on me we didn't mention that the the publisher. This is Boom Studio. Oh yeah, we did. I mention, did. Yeah, yeah, Boom Studios. Uh, but this issue came out last week. Uh-huh. Um. Uh, so as we're recording this, and and one of the reasons why I wanted to mention Boom is that you know you, we. We have discussed some Justin Jordan books in the past, and I think the last one, the last title we discussed was Strayer, uh-huh. uh, and that is Aftershock. Um, well, you know, for a split second, I thought that we had discussed the spread, but we we've never reviewed that for the podcast, um, and I know mm-hmm. we haven't discussed Peter Panzerfaust, uh, but um, but I know that. So I guess we haven't discussed Justin Jordan's comics much on on the podcast. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with them. I, I, have you read the spread or Panzerfaust? No, no. But you, you, you did, you did do. I think you did Dead Body Road on an episode that I wasn't on. Is, is that right? No. Uh, okay. No, we. I read Dead Body Road, but uh, we didn't review that. Uh, okay. For the podcast. Huh. But um, yeah. So, um, but I mean, I think this this sort of of crime book is was one of the thing. I mean, Jor- Jordan doesn't set himself uh into any any particular genre for it seems like for very long or for you know like we wouldn't identify him like we would as ed brubaker as a pretty right 
uh, you know, consistent crime writer, even though Brubaker plays around with the genre. But, you know, Jordan does fantasy, science fiction, crime, uh, you know. Uh, a, Post-apocalyptic a wide, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A wide variety of different genres that he, that he likes to play in. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things I brought up about Killer Be Killed is that I thought that it was a solid first issue, that the time I got to the huh. end, I felt – in the first time I read it, that by the time I got to the end, I felt – you know, I, I had a lot of questions, but I was supposed to have a lot of questions, and I felt as if I understood and could get involved in the story with that first issue. I, I don't know if I have the same feeling or if I had the same feeling with Sombra Number 1. I mean, I think that this is a solid first issue, but – There was a lot – when I went back after reading it, trying to think through what was going on, I had a more difficult time than I did with Killer Be Killed. Um, And I think one of the things that – I don't know if confused is the right word, but had me wondering is that the way that this first issue started off where we have – oh, I think it's a slide – that uh, or a, a short film that one of the right. DEA agents is, is showing me. And I think that at first seemed to be not really a false start, but something that didn't naturally lead to where we're introduced to Danielle in ways that seemed clear to me. Um, I, guess, I guess the bottom line is, let me ask you, I mean, do, did you feel that this is a good solid first issue that – um, set up everything well, but answered enough questions to give you a feeling of completeness. Mm. That that's a good question. I think that um, this this first issue um, makes me want to read this as a collection or as a trade. Mm-hmm. Um, so not I, as an ongoing series, and not not in not in its four issues. And and part of that is the. Um, I mean, I, I, di- I did have a little bit of what you're describing with the, that opening video that we get of um, Danielle's father um, and, and what, he is, uh, what he has been up to. Um, but I, um, I, I, it came to me more at the end of the, end of the first issue that the kind of cliffhanger ending – doesn't seem to have a, a huge amount of impact um, in a way that would be like compelling me to read the next issue. But I think I am, I am curious enough about what Jordan's doing here. And I want to see how, how the, um, how the heart of darkness parallels play out. Uh, so I will be definitely reading this more. I am just not sure if I'm going to, you know, keep buying each each individual issue, or if I'll just wait for the collection. Yeah, um, you know, in 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 one way, I feel really bad saying that you know a particular title is something that I will definitely trade weight on because I know that that doesn't do the creators mm-hmm. as much good, right? Because this right. is their livelihood. If we get the individual issues, and then if we like it, we can get the the, the complete trade. Um, but. On the other hand, I, I'm like you. I just feel that this is something that I could enjoy and appreciate more at, mm-hmm. in, at one go instead of in monthly mm-hmm. installments. And it, and it maybe I get all four issues and you know read them all at, all at once, which I've been doing with a lot of stuff lately. So. Mm-hmm. So three good books that we looked at this week. We started off with the adaptation of James Elroy's The Lagdalia. After that, we looked at issue number one of Killer Be Killed, and then we wrapped up with Sombra number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a, a nice crime-themed episode. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, it, it's we kind of planned it that way. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't start off with that idea, but once we decided we were going to discuss Black Dahlia and we knew we wanted to look at the first issue of Killer Be Killed, then you and I set off to consciously find another noir or, or noir or crime uh, comic book, and, and, exactly. and we found it in, in Sombra. Uh, and, and that reminds me, uh, I heard yesterday from one of our listeners, uh, Tristan Laurie. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, He is also a classmate of my daughter Zoe, and he asked – he was asking us if we – would ever consider doing in terms of genre themes mm-hmm. uh horror mm. and it, it's interesting I, I said that we could consider doing that uh we've done crime noir in the past mm-hmm. and i even mentioned to him that uh you know next week's episode is going to be three titles that have mm-hmm. you know th- within the same genre so it's conceivable we could do something like that with horror uh even mm-hmm. before halloween yeah. yeah. Well, my my motive for doing this crime show is uh, partially selfish because I, the thing I'm currently working on is uh, a short thing on crime comics. Uh, so um, I would have I would have wanted to read these books anyway for that research. So hmm. so so we double up, much like when. Uh, you know, when I was working on the autobiographical comics project, I wanted to do shows in which we either interviewed or r- talked about autobiographical comics. And why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to find great comics like the ones that Andy and I discussed today, then you would do well to check out the website of our sponsor for this episode, and that's Discount Comic Book Service. So go to DCBService.com, and you're going to find a ton of discounts, the greatest place to get your comics, and we can attest to that personally. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about the podcast. If you go to the website, ComicsAlternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe. You know, as we mentioned at the top of the show, feel free to leave us a message on SpeakPipe about our fourth birthday, our four-year anniversary next week. Uh, Or if you wanted to, you could pick up your phone and leave us a message by calling 4153-COMICS. That's 415 326 6427. That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Uh, or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed where we announce new content to the podcast and updates to our blog you can check out the twitter feed at the number two guys with phds that's right you can also find us on other areas of social media sphere such as facebook tumblr instagram google plus goodreads pinterest and youtube you can subscribe to the podcast through itunes you can stream us on stitcher you can also find us on tune in you can listen to us on spotify and if you're an android user also on google play music but you know you can find every single one of our episodes as well as the reviews and comics related commentary that we post on our blog by going to our website which is comicsalternative.com that's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That's right. And uh, we do want to hear from you. Uh, again, next week is going to be our four-year anniversary, so we'll be back to discuss that. Until yep. then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.